The Choctaw country lies in about 33 and 34 degrees New Orleans, Louisiana. According to the course of the Indian Path, their western lower towns are situated 200 computed miles to the northward of New Orleans, the upper ones 160 miles to the southward of the Chickasaw Nation, 150 computed miles to the west of the late dangerous French Alabama garrison in the Muscoga country, and 150 to the north of Mobile, which is the first settlement and only town, except New Orleans, that the French had in West Florida. Their country is pretty much in the form of an oblong square. The barrier towns, which are next to the Muscoga and Chickasaw countries, are compactly settled for social defense, according to the general method of other savage nations. But the rest, both in the center and toward the Mississippi, are only scattered plantations, as best suits a separate, easy way of living. A stranger might be in the middle of one of their populous, extensive towns, without seeing half a dozen of their houses in the direct course of his path. The French, to intimidate the English traders by the prodigious number of their red legions in West Florida, boasted that the Choctaw consisted of 9,000 men fit to bear arms. But we find the true amount of their numbers since West Florida was ceded to us, to be not above half as many as the French report ascertained. And indeed, if the French and Spanish writers of the American Aborigines had kept so near the truth as to mix one half of realities with their flourishing wild hyperboles, the literati would have owed them more thanks than is now their due. Those who know the Choctaw will firmly agree in opinion with the French concerning them that they are in the highest degree of a base, ungrateful, and thievish disposition, fickle and treacherous, ready-witted, and endued with a surprising flow of smooth, artful language on every subject within the reach of their ideas. In each of these qualities they far exceed any society of people I ever saw. They are such great proficients in the art of stealing that in our storehouses they often thieve while they are speaking to and looking the owner in the face. It is reckoned a shame to be detected in the act of theft, but it is the reward they receive which makes it shameful, for in such a case the traitor bastinados the covetous sinner almost as long as he seems sensible of pain. A few years ago, one of the Chickasaw warriors told me he heard a middle-aged Choctaw warrior boast in his own country at a public ball play of having artfully stolen several things from one and another traitor to a considerable amount while he was cheapening goods of us, and we were blind in our own houses. As their country is pleasantly interspersed with hills and generally abounds with springs and creeks or small brooks, and is in a happy climate, it is extremely healthful. Having no rivers in their country, few of them can swim like other Indians, which often proves hurtful to them when high freshes come on while they are out at war. Their towns are settled on small streams that purl into Mobile River, and another a little to the southward of it. Coosa, the largest town in their nation, lies within 180 miles of Mobile, at a small distance from the river which glides by that low and unhealthy old capital. The summer breezes pass by Mobile in two opposite directions, along the channel of the river, and very unhealthy vapors keep floating over the small semicircular opening of the town, which is on the south side of the river opposite a very low marsh that was formed by great torrents of water, sweeping down rafts of fallen trees till they settled there and were mixed with the black soil of the low lands, carried and subsiding there in the like manner. From thence to the opposite shore, the river hath a sandy bottom, and at low water is so very shallow that a person could almost walk across, though it is two leagues broad. The southern side of the river is so full of great trees that sloops and schooners have considerable difficulty in getting up abreast, and for a considerable distance from the sea coast, the land is low and generally unfit for planting, even on the banks of the river. About forty miles up, the French had a small settlement of one plantation deep from the bank of Mobile River. The rest of the land is sandy pine barrens, till within forty miles of the Choctaw country, where the oak and the hickory trees first appear, from whence, it is generally very fertile, for the extensive space of about 600 miles toward the north, and in some places, 250 in others, 260 in breadth, from the Mississippi. This tract far exceeds the best land I ever saw besides in the extensive American world. 
It is not only capable of yielding the various produce of all our North American colonies on the main continent as it runs from the south towards the north, but likewise many other valuable commodities, which their situation will never allow them to raise. From the small rivers that run through this valuable large tract, the far-extending ramifications are innumerable, each abounding with evergreen canes and reeds, which are as good to raise cattle in winter as the best hay in the northern colonies. I need not mention the goodness of the summer ranges, for where the land is good, it always produces various sorts of good timber, such as oak of different kinds, hickory, walnut, and poplar trees. The grass is commonly as long and tender as what the best English meadows yield, and if those vacant fertile lands of the Mississippi were settled by the remote inhabitants of Virginia, Ohio, and North Carolina, they, from a small stock, could in a few years raise a prodigious number of horses, horned cattle, sheep, and swine, without any more trouble than branding, marking, and keeping them tame, and destroying the beasts of prey, by hunting them with dogs and shooting them from the trees. Soon they might raise an abundance of valuable productions, as would both enrich themselves and their offspring, and at the same time add to a very high degree to the naval trade and manufactures of Great Britain. The Chocta have a remote but considerable town called Yawan, which is the name of a worm that is very destructive to corn in a wet season. It lies 40 miles below the seven southernmost towns of the nation, toward Mobile, and 120 computed miles from thence, on a pleasant small river, that runs south of the town. As it is a remote barrier, it is greatly harassed by the Muskoga, when at war with them. Here, a company of them came lately looking for prey. But missing it, as the Chocta were apprised and stayed at home, their pride and disappointment excited them to injure those strangers who chanced to fall in their way. About six miles below the town, they came to the camp of two white men, who were just ready to set off to Mobile with loaded horses. Being resolved not entirely to miss their errand of blood and plunder, they attacked them with their tomahawks, cautious of not alarming the neighboring enemy by the report of their guns. They speedily dispatched one of them, but the other being strong-bodied, very fiery and desperate, held them a sharp struggle, as it appeared afterward. His gun was found much battered, and the long grass quite beat down for a considerable way round the place where the Yoan Indians found him suspended in the air. For as soon as those savages perpetrated that diabolical act, they hanged each of them on trees, with the horses' halters, and carried away six of the horses loaded with dressed deer skins as far as Mobile River. Mingo Humma Echeto, the great red chieftain of the aforesaid town, on his return from war with the Muskoga, fortunately intercepted them, killed and scalped two, and retook the horses and leather. These he sent home, as he imagined the owner then resided in the nation, and would gladly redeem them with reasonable presents. While he went down to Mobile to show his trophies of war, in full hopes of getting a new supply of ammunition from the deputy superintendent, to be used against the common enemy. He flattered himself that the scalps brought into our maritime town in solemn triumph would prove a gladsome sight to our people, and enlarge their hearts towards him and his fatigued poor warriors. But he perceived nothing of this kind, of which he complained to me with very sharp language, and returned home highly incensed against his New English friends. The Choctaw, by not having deep rivers or creeks to purify themselves by daily ablutions, have become very irreligious in other respects, for of late years they make no annual atonement for sin. As very few of them can swim, this is full proof that the general opinion of the young brood of savages being able to swim like fish as soon as they come into the world ought to be entirely exploded. The Indian matrons have sense enough to know that the swimming of human creatures is an art to keep the head above water, which is gained by experience, and that their helpless infants are incapable of it. Probably the report sprung from immersing the newborn infants in deep running water by way of purification. The Chocta are the craftiest and most ready-witted of any of the red nations I am acquainted with. It is surprising to hear the wily turns they use in persuading a person to grant them the favor they have in view. Other nations generally behave with modesty and civility without ever lessening themselves by asking any mean favors, but the Chocta at every season are on the begging lay. 
I several times told their leading men that they were greater beggars and of a much meaner spirit than the white-haired Chickasaw women, who often were real objects of pity. I was once fully convinced that none was so fit to baffle them in those low attempts without offending as their countrymen. One, in my presence, expatiated on his late disappointment and losses with the several unexpected causes, and pressingly solicited his auditor as a benevolent kinsman to assist him in his distress. But the other kept his ear deaf to his importunity, and entirely evaded the artful aim of the petitioner, by carrying on a discourse he had begun before his relation accosted him as a suppliant. Each alternately began where they had left off, the one to enforce the compliance of his prayer, and the other, like the deaf adder, to elude the power of its charming him. Nature has, in a very surprising manner, ended the Indian Americans, with a strong, comprehensive memory and a great flow of language. I listened with close attention to their speeches, for a considerable time. At last, the petitioner, despairing of impressing the other with sentiments in his favor, was forced to drop his false and tragical tale and become, seemingly, a patient hearer of the conclusion of the other's long narrative, which was given him with a great deal of outward composure and cool good nature. In the year 1766, the Chocta received a considerable blow from the Muscoga. Their old distinguished war leader before spoken of, Mingo Huma Echeto, set off against the Muscoge with 160 warriors to cut off by surprise one of their barrier towns. As the waters were low, a couple of runners brought him a message from the nation, acquainting him there were two white men on their way to the Muscoga, and therefore desired him to send them back left they should inform them of the expedition, and by that means endanger the lives of the whole. But though he treated these traitors kindly at his war camp, and did not show the least diffidence of them respecting their secrecy, and sent this account back by the running messengers to his advisers, that the English were his friends, and could not be reasonably suspected of betraying them, if it were only on the situation of their own trading business, which frequently called them to various places, Yet those base-minded and perfidious men violated the generous faith reposed in them and betrayed the lives of their credulous friends. They set off with long marches, and as soon as they arrived in the country of the Muscog, minutely informed them of the Choctaw's hostile intentions and number, and the probable place of attacking the aforesaid camp, to the best advantage. The news was joyfully received and as they had reason to believe they could surprise the enemy or take them at a disadvantage, in some convenient place near their barriers, several chosen warriors well prepared set off to save their former credit by revenging the repeated affronts the Choctaw leader had given them in every engagement. He, in the most insulting manner, had often challenged their whole nation to meet him and his at any fixed time of a moon and place and fight it out when the conquerors should be masters of the conquered for the Muscoga used to ridicule the Choctaw by saying they were like wolf cubs who would not take the water but the thick swamp as their only place of security against the enemy. It must here be remembered that the Indians in general are guided by their dreams when they attend their holy ark to war, reckoning them so many oracles or divine intimations designed for their good. By those supposed sacred dictates, they will sometimes return home by one two or three at a time, without the least censure, and even with applause, for this their religious conduct. Thus, one hundred and twenty of these Chocta, after having intimidated themselves apart from the rest, with visionary notions, left the war camp and returned home. Our gallant friend, Mingo Huma Echito, addressed his townsmen on this and persuaded them to follow him against the enemy, saying, It was the part of brave warriors to keep awake and not dream like old women. He told them their national credit was at stake for their warlike conduct under him, and that honor prompted him to proceed against the hateful enemy, even by himself, though he was certain his townsmen and warlike relations would not forsake him. Forty of them proceeded, and the next day they were surrounded by a hundred and sixty of the Muscoga, several of whom were on horseback to prevent their escape. When the Chocta saw their dangerous situation, and that they had no alternative but a sudden or lingering death, they fought and became desperate men, deprived of hope. While their arrows and ammunition lasted, they killed and wounded a considerable number of the opposite party. 
But the enemy, observing their distressed situation, drew up into a narrow circle and rushed upon the remaining and helpless few with their guns, darts, clubs, and tomahawks, and killed thirty-eight. They were not able to captivate but two, whom they destined for the fiery torture. But at night, when the camp was asleep in too great security, one of them fortunately made his escape out of a pair of wooden stocks. They had flattered him with the hopes of being redeemed, but he told them he was too much of a warrior to confide in their false promises. He got safely home and related the whole affair. That red chieftain introduced our friendly embassy with such secrecy and address to all the headmen he could confide in that he soon persuaded most of them in all the neighboring towns to join heartily with him in his laudable plan. The sharpness of his feelings for the base injury he had received from the French and the well-adapted presents we sent him and his wife and gallant associates contributed greatly to give a proper weight to our embassy. Such motives as these are too often the mainsprings that move the various wheels of government, even in the Christian world. In about a month from the time we began to treat with red shoes, he sent a considerable body of his warriors with presents to me as the representative of the English traders and to my Chickasaw friends, consisting of swan's wings, white beads, pipes, and tobacco, which was a strong confirmation of our treaty of peace. And he earnestly requested of me to inform them with that candor, which should always be observed by honest friends, whether I could firmly engage that our traders would live and deal among them, as we did with the Chikasa. For a disappointment that way, he said, would prove fatal, should we entangle them with the French, in resentment of the many injuries they had long unprovokedly done us. I quieted their apprehensions on that material point of jealousy, to their entire satisfaction, and my two Chikasa friends soon expatiated upon the subject to him with a great deal of that life, wit, and humor, so peculiar to the Red Americans. We explained and confirmed anew the whole contents of our former talk concerning the dangerous French snake, assuring them that if they did not soon exert themselves against it as became brave free men, they would continue not only poor and shamefully naked below the state of other human beings, but be despised and abused in proportion to their mean passive conduct their greatest and most favorite war chieftains not accepted, as they saw verified in their chief leader, Shula Shumashtabe. But if they exerted themselves, they would be as happy as our friendly, brave, and free Chickasaw, whom the French armies and all their red confederates could no way damage but as hidden snakes, on account of their valor and the steady friendship of the English, who were always faithful to their friends even to death as every river and creek sufficiently testified, all the way from the English settlements to the Chickasaw country. We mentioned how many were killed at several places, as they were going in a warlike manner to supply their beloved friends, without any being ever captivated by the numerous enemy, though often attacked at a disadvantage, which ought to assure them that whenever the English shook hands with people, their hearts were always honest. We requested them, therefore, to think and act as our brotherly Chickasaw, who by strongly holding the chain of friendship between them and the English, were able in their open fields to destroy the French armies and in the woods bravely to fight and baffle all the efforts of their despicable mercenary enemies, though their numbers of fighting men consisted of few more than one hundred to what the Chocta contained in old hundreds or thousands. The French, we added, were liberal indeed. But to whom or for what? They gave presents to the headmen and the most eloquent speakers of their country to enslave the rest, but would not supply them with arms and ammunition without the price of blood against our traitors and the friendly Chickasaw, that they were witnesses. A whole town of sprightly promising young men had not now more than five or six guns, but they would learn to kill as many deer as the distinguished Chickasaw hunters if they firmly shook hands with the English. We convinced them that the true emblem of the English was a dress with white deer skin, but that the French dealt with them only in long, scalping knives, that we had a tender feeling when we heard the mourning voice of the tender-hearted widow, and only supplied our friends in their defense, or in revenge of crying blood, but that the French delighted in blood, and were always plotting how to destroy them and take away their lands by setting them at war against those who loved them, and would secure their liberties without any other view than as became brothers who fairly exchanged their goods.
We desired them to view the Chickasaw striplings, how readily their kindly hearts led them to listen to the friendly speech of their English trading speaker, because they knew we loved them, and enabled them to appear in the genteel dress of red people. At the whoop, they soon appeared, and cheerfully complied with our various requests, to the great satisfaction of our new Choctaw friends. The Chickasaw headmen told them with pleasure that they were glad their own honest eyes had seen the pure effects of love to their English trader and that their old people, time out of mind, had taught them so. Then they humorously enlarged on the unfriendly conduct of the French in a comparative manner and persuaded them to keep their eyes open and remember well what they had seen and heard and to tell it to all their headmen.